I'm Andy Mackin, Chief Investment Officer of Montica Global Investments. I'm Chris Tomasi, Co-Portfolio Manager. We believe that two is better than one. Two presenters are better than one presenter. We think two stock ideas are better than one. And as such, we're going to share with you today a tale of two retailers. And look, I want to start with the concept of a flywheel. Of course, a flywheel is a really heavy wheel that's difficult to get going, but once you do get it going and the momentum builds, it's difficult to stop. But of course, it's the concept of the flywheel in the retail business that is interesting to us today. Yeah, now this is what Jim Collins wrote about in his book, Good to Great. It starts with a wonderful customer experience. That drives sales higher. It pushes costs lower. Those lower costs can be shared with the customer. Sales go higher again, costs lower. Now the flywheel's spinning all by itself. Meet Tom Taylor. Now, Tom's a guy who knows something about flywheels. Tom was actually instrumental in getting the flywheel going at the Home Depot. And of course, the Home Depot, as you know, is the largest home improvement retailer in the United States. Tom joined the Home Depot in the 1980s, and 23 years later, he was running all 2,200 stores. Now, if you had have invested a dollar in the Home Depot back in the 1980s, it'd be worth north of $230 today. Jeez, Chris, wouldn't you love to go back in time and invest with Tom Taylor? Oh, of course. We actually think you can go pretty close today. You see, you can find Tom Taylor as CEO of Floor & Decor. That's the leading specialty retailer of hard surface flooring in the United States. It's a $4 billion market cap company, has $2 billion in sales across its 113 big box stores. And by the way, we actually took this photo at a recent store visit. Yes, and if you're sitting there and you're thinking that selling floors out of big factories doesn't look terribly exciting, we completely agree with you. <laughs> but it's not what they sell, it's how they sell it. And floor and decor use the flywheel. And it starts with a great customer experience from everyday low, low, low prices, the biggest stores in the business that carry the widest range of stock. So you have happy customers. And that means growing sales. And they've grown same-store sales at 15% per annum for the last decade. That greater scale can be used to lower costs. They can go direct to their suppliers, cut out the middlemen, negotiate bigger price discounts. And then they can use those lower costs to further drop the prices and invest in the customer experience. And that drives sales higher again, costs go lower, now the flywheel's spinning faster and faster and accelerating. And like all successful flywheels, once they gather momentum, they're uh, really difficult to stop. Here are a few examples of some of the more successful flywheels around the world that we know and love. Yeah. And of course, we also know that it's really difficult to disrupt a success, successful flywheel once they get going. Now, Chris, if I'm sitting in the audience today, I can probably think of a few challenges to this thesis. Uh, let's start with the big competitors out there, such as the Home Depot and Lowe's. Yeah, well, they're bigger and they've got bigger stores, but they can't allocate anywhere near as much space to flooring. So it means that Floor and Decor have five times more products available in store for the customers. And what about the risk from Amazon? Well, flooring's notoriously difficult for online, and it's because the in-store experience is critical for the customer, and the products are just too heavy and too costly to deliver from door to door. What about the impact of US tariffs? That's becoming smaller and smaller. And pretty soon, Floor and Decor are only going to source less than 20% of their products from China. But it hasn't mattered anyway. You see, they've used their scale to push back on their suppliers and negotiate far lower prices already. And some people even think the US might be going into recession. Yeah, we think the US economy is pretty strong. Uh, more importantly, we think the US housing market is strong. Mortgage applications are increasing. That leads existing home sales up, and that's the most important economic driver for floor sales, Andy. Exactly right. Uh, low interest rates are a powerful tailwind. Now, we believe the true earnings power of floor and decor is hidden, and that's why this opportunity exists today. If you take a look at the profit margin of floor and decor over the last few years and compare it to, say, the profit margin of the Home Depot, it looks relatively poor. But there's a very good reason for this, which is currently not being appreciated by the market. Now, if you think about the profit margin profile of an individual store, stores start out negative, so they actually lose money in the early years, and the profit margin becomes highly positive in the later years. 
What's interesting is that more than half of Flora and Decor's stores are less than three years old today. So these are lowly profitable stores today, but highly profitable stores in the future. And the more stores that Flora and Decor can open with unit economics like that, the more valuable the company's going to become. And there is a long runway ahead for them. In fact, Tom Taylor expects to get to 400 stores in the next decade. We think he's going to make that target early, and then they're going to continue to expand. But that's been completely overlooked by the market. And the stock's at $43 today, and we think that's far too cheap. In fact, we think that the stock's worth twice as much. And it's going to continue to compound value at double-digit rates well into the next decade. So we own Florin Decor today because it satisfies our internal criteria. It's a high-quality business, well-positioned in a growing industry, but significantly undervalued today. Now, uh, Chris, what if the flywheel went into reverse? Yeah, well, of course, we've already seen it, and it's happening in the UK brick-and-mortar retail space. Well, here's a guy who knows something about the UK brick-and-mortar retail space. Mike Ashley, he's a true retail genius, self-made billionaire and founder of Sports Direct, which is the UK's largest retailer of sports equipment, of, uh, sports equipment and apparel. Interestingly, he also owns Newcastle United, for any of you football fans out there. Now, here's what Mike had to say about the UK brick-and-mortar retail space just a few weeks ago. It's in dire straits. Without substantial support from the government, it's in a terminal state. And Mike would know. You see, online competition has damaged his business. Sales have been declining for years already. In fact, the sales have fallen so low that he's lost bargaining power with suppliers. So the big brands are holding back product. The costs are going up. There's little money left to invest in the stores. And what it all means is that shoppers are seeing worse prices. The stock's out of date and out of fashion, if it's even available in the store. And the stores themselves are understaffed and they're all run down. So it's a pretty terrible experience for the shopper. And that means that sales have fallen even further. Of course, costs go up. And now that flywheel is spinning faster and faster. But this time, it's spinning in the wrong direction. So we look for four characteristics that make a good short. We look for structural headwinds at the industry level, such as those that we're seeing in the UK brick and mortar retail space. We look for divergent expectations or overvaluation, which we also believe exists today. But we also look for asymmetries in the stock and misperceptions in the business. So let's now take a look at asymmetries. And what we know is that debt has been building significantly in this business over recent years, and that increases the chances of future financial distress. We also know that inventories have been building even more significantly, and that increases the chance of future forced discounting. And even Mike Ashley conceded recently that with the higher inventories comes a much higher risk that your products are going to go out of fashion. But it gets even worse. Mike's now concerned that the big brands, the Nikes and the Adidas's of the world, are going to cut supply off completely. And if that wasn't bad enough, we found another big asymmetric risk on page 143 of the annual report. The Belgian tax authorities are after Sports Direct for, for 674 million euros in back taxes and penalties. It's about a third of the market cap today. Now let's take a look at misperceptions. Well, last year, Sports Direct acquired House of Fraser to create the illusion of growth. This single acquisition increased the company's retail floor space by around 50%. Mm, and increased annual losses by about 50 million pounds. Yeah, no, it hasn't been going so well. Here's what Mike had to say about the House of Fraser acquisition recently. He said, the problems are nothing short of terminal. <laughs> he said, on a scale of five, with one being very bad, House of Fraser is a one. And it's not just us questioning the company's accounts. You see, earlier this year, Grant Thornton resigned as the firm's auditors. And in the company's own words, they don't think that a firm outside of the big four audit firms could cope with the complexities of the job. And so they went to each of the big four, and all four of them said no. And number five and six said no as well. And finally, after a very lengthy search, they appointed the number seven auditor in the market just a couple of weeks ago. And look, staff have had concerns as well. In recent weeks, Karen Byers, the retail chief and a 28-year Sports Direct veteran, left the business. So did the chief financial officer. So did the company secretary. But uh, Mike's replenishing the ranks, right, Chris? Uh, yeah, in a way. Uh, you see, Mike appointed his future son-in-law to run the £250 million 
property fund and he's just paid him 10 million pounds for the last two years of work which is more than most companies pay their CEOs in the FTSE 100. And what are his prior experiences? Well, before joining Sports Direct, Andy, uh, his only prior experience was as a nightclub promoter in London. <laughs> this is why we're short Sports Direct. Thank you very much. Thank you.